give me the wink when it's time to tell the viewers what's coming up. Okay, you'll hear my wink. It'll be that loud. (laughs) (laughs) The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson, Richard James and Chris Dayan. Uh, Richard James, before you ask. Right, Jamie Anderson, before you ask. Uh, co-host of the Jerry Anderson podcast. Also, same role. That's bizarre, wow. isn't it? How strange that two co-hosts should be sat opposite one another. I must check the credits and see if it gets top billing. I can't remember. I think you do. It's alphabetical, isn't it? Yeah. By surname. Yes. Yes. I knew I should change my name to Richard Aardvark. <laughs> I wish you had. Uh, anyway, so yes, this is uh, Jamie Hansen and Richard Aardvark on the Jerry Hansen podcast, also joined by yeah. the randomizer general himself. Oh, thank goodness. There he is. Chris Dale. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Oh, Hi guys. Yeah. It's nice. It's his little beaming face. It's still, me up. Still in the same T-shirt. I know. I know. I didn't want to mention really that. Really getting problematic now. <laughs> yeah. I'm just grateful that he's that side of the studio. I know, but it's... It's, it's drifting, isn't it? Yeah. We it's need- a bit like in the old days when we just go to the cinema. People used to smoke. In yeah. the cinema, but they were allowed to smoke at the back of the cinema. But in of course, the smoking section just kind of yeah. wafted forward. I don't get that whole smoking and non-smoking section. Yeah. I remember them. Well, it's a bit like the t-shirt yeah, and not the randomizer and not. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah. Anyway, yes. yes so anyway, all coming up later. Also, <clears throat> oh, is it time? This episode. Oh, I, I thought I was going to say that bit. Oh, sorry. Okay, you just give me the wink. Wink. <laughs> that was it. All right. This episode. Yeah, fat facts. Part two of an interview with Sadie Miller. It's not going great, is it? Uh, we hear from our wonderful Potsrons and the randomizer. Great. Uh, I don't think I'll do that again. The T-shirt ever. sort of really promised the world and delivered Bogner Regis. Yeah. It was it's all over case, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Very stylized. That's, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think yeah. it only happened in certain episodes of Space 1999 in the titles. I think. I think it changed. First episode. First episode. There you go. Thank goodness for the randomizer and yeah. his incredible knowledge. And, and his t-shirt. Your great t-shirt. And my t-shirt. Good. Uh, do you have any Thunderbirds or Space 1999 t-shirts you want to tell us about, Podstrons at home? Because <laughs> if you do, you could just email us at podcast at jerryanderson.com. Right. That's the sort of contribution we're asking for now. <laughs> do you own any t-shirts, listeners? I mean, <laughs> I mean, we've done 285 podcasts. It's like, you know. We've done 286. This is 287. <gasps> Do keep no up. wonder we're running out of content. Oh, no, goodness me. Uh, do remember, yes. if you've got any ideas for our 300th Ooh-hoo! episode, we'd love to know your thoughts. Email us or send stuff in for the Facebook yep. group or yep. uh, whatever. Or mm. we still haven't had a letter. No. We haven't had a handwritten note arrive no, no. at the studio A yet. missive. Yeah, so that could An still epistle. be you. Yeah, I'll stop now. Okay, good. Uh, well, I'm yes, looking forward to on. getting one of those. Come on. No, no, you don't need to yeah, do this come anymore. On. What? Because you've already... Now, revealed that you actually yeah, like Fab Facts. And this I've is gone off it now, after last week. Okay, fine. It's well, better be a good one. It in will that case, this. I think it'll probably be the best one we've ever had. Right. It's this week's Fab Fact. Now, time for this week's Fab Facts. Uh, so I have a book, book of, of Fab, fab facts, facts, as you know, full of Fab, fab facts. facts. I flick through flick the book of Fab Facts. Shout fab. shout fab. and Random point. Yeah, read all, right, fine. all right, fine. Here we go. Fab! Ha <laughs> ha! Didn't start flicking. You can't shout Fab before the flick. Fab, I did it. <laughs> if you're not going to play along, then I'll just do it without wow. you. Wow. Okay. You just blown it wide open there. <laughs> you just don't care anymore. I don't think there's anything to blow wide open okay, here. Cool. Richard James yes. for the Fab Fact for Pod 287. <laughs> Who'd have thought? You know how you can buy almost <laughs> anything in the supermarket these days? Yes, yeah? you can. Budget supermarkets in particular are famous yep. for their Isle of Wonders. Yeah, that's the, right. The Little Middle, etc. That's it, yeah. Where you can literally buy anything from a chainsaw yes. to a pair of gentlemen's slacks yes. to go along with your weekly grocery you shop. You can, yes. Yeah? Gentlemen's slacks. Have you recently definitely. bought no. chainsaw or gentlemen's slacks? I've certainly bought some gentlemen's slacks. Oh, interesting. Okay, very what good. What are slacks? Sounds some, like comfortable sh- uh, trousers. Some sort it? of trouser, yeah. <laughs> I guess they're a bit loose. Is that where they're Right, slacks, perfect. I guess. Anyway, that's yeah. not the fact. No. Did you know, however, hmm. that one of the more famous and oldest supermarket names almost made a Jerry Anderson film? Really? Look at your face of disbelief. A face of disbelief. Let mm, me blow that face of disbelief wide open. Go on, then. <laughs> yes. Supermarket in question. Tesco. Right. Film in question, yes. Jerry Anderson's A Christmas Miracle. Oh. 
right. Tesco were due to finance said film, which was a Christmas alien invasion story that Dad was hoping to have made around 2007, 2008. Yeah. This was at the same time that Tesco were making so much money yes. that they had some cash to spare. So they set up a production subsidiary, Tesco Films. I see. Very catchy name, isn't, isn't it? it? I wonder how they thought of that. Yes. It's a it, bit like starting a podcast about Jerry Anderson and calling it the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Yes, all right. But the meetings we had about that. It, yes, fine. But it, well, it was worth it, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, it could be suggested that at the instruction of their accountants, it had been set up as something of a tax write-off. Or, or, but we're not yes. suggesting that. No. You could suggest it, but we're yes. not. No, no, uh, but not. nevertheless, Tesco Films had lots of meetings with Dad. Letters of intent were exchanged, and it was all looking very, very positive indeed. Right. A distributor was then brought on board as the final piece of the jigsaw. And finally, a Christmas miracle stood on the brink <sighs> of production. Yeah, but we know. I mean... Well, well, don't spoil the ending. Well, I think we know the ending, because... Yeah, all right. But... Well, yeah. as Richard has alluded to, yes. in a severe case of the best laid plans yes. coming to nothing, Tesco Films was then closed down and the film went down with it. Oh. Sadly, after all this, Dad just wasn't well enough to continue. So for now, a Christmas miracle awaits a resurrection elsewhere. Oh, OK. Tesco, meanwhile, started funding a small film studio intended to produce Tesco-exclusive direct-to-DVD films in around 2010. The first film released was called Paris Connections. Hmm. and was based on a popular novel by Jackie Collins. Oh. So who knows, perhaps one day you will get to go home with a Jerry Anderson movie in your shopping basket from Tesco's, or maybe the whole idea is one sandwich short of a meal deal. Oh! Ho, 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 ho. Okay, whoever writes these things are uh, brilliant. Are they? Uh, yes. Witty. Very yeah, witty. Very, very mm. funny. Uh, anyway, what do you think, Podstrons? Yeah. Would a, would a Tesco's Christmas miracle, a oh. Tesco yeah. Jerry Anderson... I mean, it would, obviously it would have been Tesco Finest... Oh, of course it would. Film, not That's a Tesco right. value range. That's right. <laughs> but, <laughs> exactly. uh, yes. How interesting. I mean, you, I suppose you take money wherever you can find it if you're making a film. You do. It's very tricky to raise the cash. Are, are Tesco still out there making I don't think things? they're doing film stuff now. No, no. That's no right. But I mean, I remember, this is a very strange memory, uh, the, uh, the letter of intent from Tesco at home, yeah. in the kitchen, uh, on the breadboard... Right. Under a bread knife. I don't know why it was there. Ooh. Strange place to keep sounds it. Sounds like maybe it was through your dad's Instagram account or something. It sounds like a bit, a bit of an Insta. I don't think it was doing Insta. No, 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 no. Oh, no. no. but it was, it was a real thing. And mm. it was, you know, it was all looking really, really positive. And yeah. then just, Boom. yeah. Gone. Collapsed. Yeah. Collapsed like the car view in Captain Scarlet. <gasps> oh, I like that. Mm. Nicely done. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. What a shame. Yeah. But uh, yes, it does remain in the archive, mm -hmm. awaiting the correct time, because mm -hmm. it's a lovely little story. I'm sure it is. Which I can't tell you, because nope. I don't want to spoil it for nope. anybody. That's but, right. Yeah, it was very sweet, and he was very fond of it, so mm. perhaps one day. Yeah, great. Nice. There you go. Thanks very much. Um, like uh, it. Postrons, have you got any other ideas for supermarkets funding films, or shoe shops funding I mean, There's got to be releases? some puns in there, isn't there? Really? Yeah, I bet the Postrons on the old Facebook group are going mad for okay. this. Okay, email your puns. Shoe companies, financing... Jerry Anderson shows. Yes. Supermarkets. Bakeries. Yes. Butchers. Yep. Candlestick makers. Puns galore in there. Yeah, I loads. Think. Okay. I can't think of any myself, obviously, but... Um, no, nor me. Well, let's not spoil the Postron's fun. Email us podcast at mm -hmm. with your hilarious film funding and other related high street suggestions. Just in time for Terry Adlam, who'll be joining us in a couple of weeks' time, of course, ah. for a very Terry Christmas. It'd be great to have some puns there for can't him. Can't wait. You'll like please, that. Yeah. Please do send them. Yes, in. yes. Nice. Anyway, there you go. Yes, you've redeemed yourself. Quite Have I? That. Yeah. Thank goodness for, for another that. week. I'll let you do another week, I think, and then we'll see how we go. You're so kind. Good. Right. Well, that brings <laughs> us then, very neatly, to the end of this week's Tesco, Tesco Facts. Facts. Other supermarkets oh. are available. Nice. Yeah. Thank goodness we won't get told off by Ofcom now. This is the voice of the Podsterons. Uh, now, the Podstrons, there are uh, over a thousand of them on our Facebook group. Which means there are probably a thousand more. Well, that we know there are at least... Well, we know that. Two or three or four thousand. Absolutely who listen, right. So. Yeah. Uh, but some of them have been in touch. Not all of them, thankfully, because that would be a lot of emails to wade through. Mm. But some of them have emailed us at podcast at jerryanderson.com. For example, Emily got in touch Hi, to Emily. say... Hi, Jamie, Richard and Chris. 
Hello, Emily. Uh, hope you're well. Um, though I've been listening to the podcast since 2021, this is my first email. Oh, well, welcome. Yeah. I basically just wanted to rave about how the podcast and the community have led me to discovering the wider world of Jerry Anderson. Job done. That is exactly why we do this. So yeah. Thanks, Emily. Uh, I've watched Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet since childhood, early 2000s reruns on BBC Two, and got back into them in 2020. Since then, I've discovered the podcasts and met a lovely bunch of people. I love how you said I podcast, quite then. Either. Yeah. Uh, specifically, the folks at the Potter's Arms Zoom call. Re- re- get repeated mentions. Yeah. Well done, Willow and Co. Lovely. Thanks to the community, I've delved deeper into the Andiverse, and Stingray has become my flagship show. But I also really enjoyed discovering Joe Ninety. Sorry, Jamie. You don't have to apologise to me. That's fine. Fireball, Fort Feather Falls, UFO, and most recently Terrorhawks. Great. It's Terrorhawks that prompted this email simply because I'm still in shock by how much I liked it. What? What? Expect the unexpected indeed. Yes. Having been surrounded by Super Mario Nation for so long, I'd refused to watch Terror Hawks for ages because I didn't like the style of the puppets. Ooh. On the 40th anniversary, I decided to try the first episode. Then the second. Then the third. Ah, oh, these things happen, you see. As it turns slope. out, yeah, the puppets didn't bother me at all. And though I missed the wider full body shots you often got in the likes of Stingray and Thunderbirds, it didn't ruin the experience. Mm. The stories are fun, the sets and model work are amazing, and the music is pretty awesome. But for me, Windsor Davies as Sergeant Major Zero was the standout star. I'm not going to do an impression. Oh, come on. That's what <laughs> we're all waiting for. It's a real shame oh. I hadn't watched it at the time of the concert. <laughs> Lovely boy. Oh. Uh, uh, or else I would have appreciated the Terror Hawk suite much more. Oh, it was lovely, that. I've also been listening to some of the audio stories on YouTube and enjoyed them so much that I've asked for the rest of them for Christmas. Brilliant. <sighs> this is great. We've made a real convert I here. know. Sorry I've gone on a bit. No, no please do. fine. Uh, but I just wanted to thank you guys and the rest of the Podstrons for keeping the legacy of Jerry Anderson alive so 20-somethings like me and younger can continue to discover all his shows. All the very best, Emily. Brilliant. Isn't that nice? Pia, she says, is Einstein okay? You'd think Zero had shredded his winning lottery ticket or something. Einstein's just very grumpy. Ah. But we deal with that in the audio series. Mm, Which enjoy. Emily's getting for Christmas. Yes, enjoy, Emily. I love that. That's great. That's exactly why we do what we do. Yeah. So that everyone who already loves, loves the stuff can carry on enjoying it yeah. and expand their interests and we can welcome newbies alike. Yes. So she's mentioned there she'd listen to some free... Uh, Terrorhawks audio yes. stuff. Do you think she listened to my uh, performance as Jeremy Vile? Jeremy Vile, yes, yes, it's quite nice, possible. It? Yeah, amazing. Yeah. yeah, great. That's probably why she's so into it. Oh, I would imagine so. She heard your award should have been nominated um, performance. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I've got an email here from Jonathan Spencer. Oh, that's nice. Jonathan writes, mm. "Hello, Richard and Jamie, aka the Knights of the Jerry Anderson Podcast Roundtable." I mean, it is round. Here it is. Yeah. That's right. Okay, good. Uh, I've not emailed in a while, even though I'm listening and watching the fabulous pods. Uh My apologies. That's fine. Yeah. I wanted to ask, as Christmas is round the corner, whether there will be new Anderson Christmas jumpers available soon. I bought every one since the store started selling them, and I think brand new ones would be incredibly popular. Hmm. I have a couple of suggestions for designs. Maybe a Terrorhawks one. Mm -hmm. Zelda with uh, a long white beard and a Christmas hat. (laughs) I'm not sure we'll get that. (laughs) You'll get get that detail in the nick, but maybe. Maybe Candy and Andy pulling a cracker. Uh, Maybe not. Maybe Torchy could make an appearance. Absolutely not. (laughs) Just some random ideas from an Anderson Christmas jumper fan. Sorry for the long waffle. It wasn't long. Not at all. Keep up the good work and keep those eagles flying. I just landed it, but yeah, okay. Uh, All the best, Jonathan Spencer. Mm. So, Jonathan, Mm. Christmas jumpers. Mm. Not this year. Too late now. I mean, it's, you know, we. The weird thing with the Christmas jumpers is we have to order them in, like, February. Right. So, you know, and they're getting manufactured in the summer. Yeah. It's a very weird process. Yeah. I think we're looking at doing a Christmas t shirt. Because when we do the Christmas jumper, our lovely Antipodean friends. Oh, right, of course. Say, I can't possibly wear this jumper. It's 35 (laughs) degrees. What about a Christmas t shirt? And I think, you know. You can wear a T-shirt indoors in, in the warmth in yeah. front of the fire yeah. and you still get the Christmas thing. Right. So okay. Christmas we're going to t-shirt. try that this year. Hmm. And there's a rather lovely design that's just awaiting approval from our Ooh. dear friends at ITV. So right. keep an eye out for the Christmas T-shirt. Lovely. Uh, hello, Jamie, Richard, Chris, and of course, the, of course, the rest of the team. Uh, it's been a while since I last emailed the podcast. A lot of people say that's that. That's the theme that's currently. That's fine, yeah. You don't okay. have to email every week. Yeah, and you just, just have to apologise for not emailing. No, it's But fine. that's fine. Uh, not to mention catching up with the latest episodes due to work. I understand. Fair enough. Busy lives. However, I have been active on the Facebook group, leaving Great. comments and posts for all. Well, that's nice. I managed to listen to the fourth and fifth Thunderbird audiobooks on my Sony Walkman A55L. 
uh, back during the summer season. I have to admit a slight tear was shed following a short tribute to Matt Zimmerman. Ah, yes. Mm. On a positive note, I really enjoyed the two UFO audiobooks and Nicholas Briggs' narration. Oh, good. Will we be expecting more in the coming months? Keep up the good work preserving your father's legacy, FAB and SIG, Scott By. Cheers, Scott By. Mm. Uh, yes, we're doing more things. Oh, the right. stuff. In uh, fact, I had a, wow. m- had a meeting with Nicholas Briggs. Oh, did you? Who, as well as being creative director for Big Finish, is also executive producer for Audio for Anton Entertainment. Yes. And we plotted out all sorts of stuff over the next 18 months or so. Cranky so, Moses. Yeah, Amazing. well, yes. So stand by for more audio. Oh. Was okay. that a hint? No. No, I just... That's just, just a phrase. I see, it's just a phrase you use. Yeah, yeah. fine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. Uh, I've got one from the Podstron known as Top Hat. Oh, right. Fine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hello, Jamie, Richard, Chris, and whoever else happens to be in the studio. Right. So that's Ross and Charlotte. Charlotte. Hi, Ross and Charlotte. Uh, I am a newer Jerry Anderson fan. Fine. And heard about it through the Thunderbirds 2015 release. I was just saying to somebody yesterday that that brought loads of new fans to the classic worlds of Anderson, which is great. Yeah. I'm only a teen, mm-hmm. uh, and a lot of people would say I'm about 20 years too young to be a fan of Anderson's work. Well, we would never say no. that, Top Hat, no. ever, ever, ever. Nope. I heard about a podcast when I was around nine. Right. But I didn't listen to it because I thought it was boring to listen to two middle-aged men blabber about something irrelevant in this day. And age. hang on, excuse me, has he written into the right podcast here? Two middle-aged men One blabbering middle-aged on, man, surely. Well, um, let's not comment on that. Uh, but, he's um, much younger co-host. Okay, I'll try and read that without so much venom this time. <laughs> but I didn't listen to it because I thought it was boring to listen to two middle-aged men blabber about something irrelevant in this yeah, day and age. That's, but that's fair enough. Yeah. But. Yeah. Recently, however, mm. I have started to listen to the podcast on the bus to school. I'm really enjoying it, and I hope you read this email. Kind regards, kind regards, top hat. Brilliant. Well, yes, we are. We did read it, yes. and I'm very glad you're listening to it. Yes. And, you know, yeah. from two apparently middle-aged men no, blabbering on about stuff, no, we are very happy Absolutely. to have you join us. Yes, I mean, I, we often talk about our oldest and our youngest <laughs> listeners, don't we? Yes. I wonder what the age spread is between our youngest and our oldest. I mean... I think it's probably at about 60 years, well maybe be. more. Isn't that amazing? I know, that's right. When people say, you know, what's the demographic yeah, well, of the podcast? <laughs> well, we say, well... Everyone. Uh, yeah, humans. Yeah, humans. Ah, oh, a few dogs listen as well, I reckon. Really? Yeah. Okay. A cat. If you've got a dog sheep. or cat that listens, please email Your us sheep in. listen? The sheep don't know. They oh. don't, they're not allowed in the house anymore. <laughs> anyway. Yes, all for now. Podcast at jerryanderson.com. That's where we ask you to send emails, and that's where I collect them yes. and uh, collate them to read them out on the podcast. Yes. Thank you. So if you send them anywhere else, it's unlikely they'll, they'll get through. Yes. Don't, don't so please use else. only that address. Now, I think it's time that we uh, say hello to our special guest for the second week running. Yes. Shall we? I'd love if she would come back about now. <laughs> This week's guest is steeped in the worlds of science fiction, most notably Doctor Who. But luckily for us, she carries a torch for Gerry Anderson too. She stepped into her mother Liz Sladen's shoes as Sarah Jane Smith for Big Finish, and she's an accomplished author and poet. But she's always happy to take time out to watch her favourite Super Marionation shows and talk about them. It's Sadie Miller! Uh, well, Sadie, we obviously didn't scare you off too much. No. Because <laughs> you've come back to join us again. Thank you for having me. <laughs> no, not at all. It's our pleasure. Um, last week, we spoke about your earliest Addison memory, and we had visions of you wafting around your living room, uh, pretending to be Aquamarina from Stingray. Uh, this week, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about your writing, about your career as an actor, uh, how you got a bit further into that world via various training avenues and so on. And we'll, of course, be touching on Big Finish. Uh, and we'll also be looking at uh, your favourite Anderson moment. Uh, so tell us about your writing. Now, I understand uh, that you've, uh, prior to uh, taking over as Sarah Jane Smith, you dipped your toe into the Doctor Who world a, a little bit earlier as well with the Lethbridge Stewart novel. Yes, yeah, so uh, the novel uh, Moonblink I wrote in 2016. Oh. Um, I have a very weird memories of it, though. I was pregnant at the time, and I remember going back and forth with my, my editor, and it just sort of all... <laughs> Right. <laughs> it came, came together. Um, but I was obviously apprehensive about writing something where it was someone else's characters primarily and having to do that research. And obviously there's certain characters you can't mention. You have to be a bit uh, careful of, of yes. that. But that was a, a great experience. Right. Um, and writing is something that I feel... I guess more drawn to now, especially getting older, being able to write your own stories and create your own um, 
way of, of looking, looking mm. at the world. Mm. Are um, you a bit of a control freak then? Because that's what I feel about writing. Is I, yeah. You write a character, you think, I could, I could kill you if I wanted. <laughs> Is that not appeal? Well, <laughs> going a bit dark there for a minute. Um, yeah, to, to a certain extent, I feel like uh, the creative industries are not necessarily geared towards women or women having, maybe not so much now, but certainly when I was younger, having the longevity of career that, say, a man might do. And mm. I think writing your own stuff is a great way to kind of circumnavigate that. So I've written something for myself, which is like a one-woman show, which ah. hopefully will be going... Uh, doing fringe festivals ah. next year, so that would be quite fun. Right? Is that an um, exclusive? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, no, not not necessarily exclusive. <laughs> but, um, I, I definitely feel more attracted to writing my own things, yeah. creating my own things, and I guess that feeds more into what we were talking about before about you know playing and yes. wanting to enjoy the creative side rather than it necessarily being um, financially motivated yes. as the primary yes concern. Yes. Well, good luck with that in this business Thank you. to be financially <laughs> motivated. Yeah. Uh, I'm intrigued by this uh, one woman show, though. So is this uh, from your own, is it sort of autobiographical or is it a, a, a fictional so, take on a, another character's life? Or? So it's it's kind of a mix of both, I guess. It's kind of a horror comedy and it's called A Girl is a Haunted House. And it's mm -hmm. about the horror story, I guess, of being of being a woman. But it's uh -huh. not necessarily completely female centric. It's, uh -huh. um, I guess, a bit about the millennial experience. It's yeah. obviously the perspective that I, I have yep. to, to write from. But yep. um, hopefully people will enjoy it and take from it something yeah. longer lasting, I hope. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Um, so entering the world of Lethbridge Stewart, now mm. I understand, uh, as you said, it's not it's not a Doctor Who novel by any means. Sure. But did that involve looking at the old series and to try and get a handle on the character in some oh, way? Oh, definitely. I yeah. mean, I did get to meet Nick Courtney a few times oh. um, and I think he was always quite Brig-like, I would yeah, say, a bit yeah. kind of, not standoffish, but, yeah. you know, held himself a bit differently, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so I definitely had to look more into his episodes and his his character because yeah. um, it's not something I would necessarily have known that much just from watching the series. But I think he's quite interesting, isn't he? Because there's so much with his backstory that Absolutely. can then obviously lead into yes. other, other stories. Yes. Uh, I mean, rather like, uh, you know, Sarah Jane Smith, the, the companions are just as mm. important a part of the show as the Doctor themselves. You know, that's uh, an extraordinary thing. It seems that, that you're sort of remarkably unfazed about... Um, uh, rekindling or maybe recreating or revisiting classic characters. Uh, obviously, Sarah Jane Smith is a classic character we know, and Lethbridge Stewart too. So you were never sort of phased by <laughs> diving in headfirst? It's, and... it's where I've gone wrong. <laughs> I, <laughs> no, not particularly. I think all characters are created equal to an extent in that as a creative a performer, whoever, you can all come in on that same baseline and do with them what you can with your capacity as like mm. a writer or, or an actor mm. um so i think if you start with any creative job if you start to think too much about it you get into that very over analytical self saboteur area i would suggest uh -oh, so yes. yeah okay. if you think about it too deeply True. i think it can trip trip you up a bit yeah, so yeah um i guess just saying yes to things and then <laughs> seeing how they pan out so yeah. sometimes is yeah, way exactly to go. right. Yeah, I'm doing a theatre show at the moment. Uh, it's, it's a Sherlock Holmes show. Oh, wow. And I was talking to the, the guy who's playing Sherlock uh, the other day, and he said, we're doing it again a second time. And he said last year he was sort of crippled with self-doubt because he was playing Sherlock Holmes. But then he realised, no, that's not the way to approach it. I'm just playing a character who happens to be called Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. So maybe there's something totally. of that in there as well, isn't there? Oh, you yeah, just absolutely. happen to be writing for a character who happens to be called Lethbridge Stewart or playing a character who happens to be called Sarah J. Smith. And maybe that takes the pressure off a little. Um, yeah, interesting. Um, now, uh, I'd like to go back to your favourite Anderson memory. And it's interesting that uh, you mentioned something there uh, about your one-woman show being something of a, a horror story. And uh, that chimes a little bit with your uh, favourite Anderson moment. So let's have a look. <laughs> It's a galleon. An old fashioned sailing ship. I can hardly believe it. Uh, is it wrecked, Troy? She looks seaworthy enough. Can you see any sign of life aboard, Troy? No, sir. 
She looks deserted. I'll give her a call on the loud hailer. Oi there! Anyone on board? And there's the title, <laughs> Stingray, the ghost ship. Interestingly, when we ask guests for favourite characters or moments or scenes, they're never that specific. Oh, but really? you came back and said, ghost ship, Stingray, the moment where the ship appears out of the fog. So what was it that arrested you so much about that scene? Oh, I love it. I just It's <laughs> the aesthetic that I enjoy to a T. And I love that, that moment where you know something's coming and yeah. you're just waiting and that little musical trill yeah, yeah. my skin just goes all smoky just yeah. watching it. I think it's fantastic it's so cleverly done yeah and for kids shows I love where there's that kind of that darkness that otherness I think it's so mm. important for children mm. to um, experience that in a so I guess I talked about it in 30 years in the TARDIS last week but mm. um, that idea of a safe danger almost I think is, is fantastic so yeah safe danger yeah that's really interesting isn't it yeah. Is that something that uh, you wish you'd have with, with your with your boys? I mean, would you would you ever, would you sit down and watch the ghost ship with them if you could find it online? Or yeah. Would they enjoy it, do you think? I guess so. I don't know. That's a good point. Yeah. I maybe have to get them to watch it. My kids do uh, don't shy away from the dark side of things, I guess. So, yeah. yeah, maybe they would enjoy it actually. Yeah. I'd have to Sit them down. I mean, I follow you on Instagram, oh. seen various posts. You <laughs> seem to inhabit many different worlds, <laughs> if I could put it like that. Is that your experience of life, that there is perhaps more than, than meets the eye? <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> it's chaos. Yeah, right. Um, I, I guess so. I mean... Um, and is that a comfort? I, I don't know. Yeah. I suppose so. Um, I feel like... I don't know. It gets a bit dark now, doesn't it? I feel like <laughs> from... Going through life things, obviously watching my mum pass away and things and yeah. then go through a very difficult divorce and things like that. I just am at a place in life where I think you have to enjoy life in a, like a visceral way. You have to just uh -huh. put yourself out there and be present in every area of your life. Yeah. So when I'm at home with my kids, I'm just mum. When I'm at work, I get to do things like this. It's yeah. so enjoyable to just connect with other humans and the yeah. same with creative things. So I, I don't edit myself I guess for better yeah. or for worse no I think it's so better I think that's a good sort of coda to live by whatever you've been through you know what I mean that's just to be present and enjoy every moment yeah definitely difficult to do sometimes I know but uh, but there we are uh, now talk to us then about um, I know you went on various training courses at National Youth Theatre and RADA I think was this you just sort of dipping your toe in or preparing yourself for life as an actor or just a way of getting new tools for whatever life may, may throw at you? Yeah, so my parents were always very academically minded and they pushed me very hard to be very academic. Uh -huh. And I'm not. Right. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, unfortunately. Um, so I went to university and then after university, I did a few different courses before prepping for um, my auditions for drama school. Um, but I did also try and be an agent. I interned at oh. different agents office. But unfortunately, I sort of came out of university 2008-ish time when yeah. obviously there was the big recession. Oh, yeah. So I couldn't really get a job properly. So I went to drama school almost as like, well, I guess I'm doing this now. Okay. I've, my fallback, which is totally ridiculous. <laughs> well, and then I came out again. It's like, oh, another recession. What a dream. What a dream. Bad timing. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, um, but I always like to be busy and doing things and doing yeah. creative stuff. And the National Youth Theatre is obviously great running courses for, for younger people of all yeah. backgrounds and abilities to get into drama, which is fantastic. And yeah. Raja as well, they do this. I think it's four weeks of Shakespeare, oh, yeah. which is, is wonderful to Amazing. get to, to dive into yeah. um, as well. So, yes, I'd uh, recommend both of those for yeah. anyone interested. Oh, great. Uh, no, the agent uh, side of things is interesting. Is that is that a side of the business you might yet find yourself in, do you think? Or? Well, it was more, I think, because I, after leaving university and, you know, having all those years of studying and structure, it felt very weird to then think about going into a very creative headspace again. So I wanted to kind of make sure and right. do something more office-minded again. But obviously... I I, I, I think if I'd gotten a job as an agent, maybe that would have gone down that trajectory. Yes, but yes. because obviously they, there was this big intern culture at the time, which I think has kind of phased out a bit. Right. Um, that didn't happen. So yeah. yeah. See, see where life goes. Well, quite. Exactly right. Uh, and let's see what the uh, viewers and listeners have been sending in, shall we? We have some more questions oh, for lovely. you. In our Space 1999 lunchbox. Came all the way from America, this, you know. Did it? One oh, our, wow. Uh, one of our listeners, yeah. Robert uh, found oh, it for us. So have a dive so cool. in there. and. Thank uh, you. 
see who we've got. Yeah. Our Paul Hyder. Hmm. With you and Jamie both having a famous parent, I wonder how that affected your upbringing and whether you know any other people with a famous parent. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know we've touched a bit before yes. that for me, it didn't really affect my upbringing massively. And I don't think I do know anyone with like, I guess that when you have parents in the business, you, you know of, of them, but mm. I, I don't think... It's not like a little Facebook group. No, we all you don't have your own WhatsApp group. Tap in. Yeah, 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 the group <laughs> famous, chat. Famous, famous um, children. I guess yeah. the only other person I would know is Daisy. Um, Ashford, of course, really. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yes, but no, yeah, al indeed. alas, not. Yeah, have you worked with Daisy at Big Finish, no, or you're not no. here together yet? No. Not yet. Hopefully, fingers oh, crossed in the yeah, future. A crossover would be good. Yes, That'd why not? Yeah. Picture myself again. Yeah, there Thanks we go. Thanks for helping me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's from uh, Morty Vicker. Oh, Sadie, I've loved your performances as Sarah Jane with Big Finish in Third and Fourth Doctor Adventures. I know you've done some writing in the past as well. Imagine then that Big Finish and Jamie approach you with a proposal to write an audio adventure for them from the Anderson universe. Number one, which of the Anderson franchises would you choose to write for? And two, which of the characters do you think you give the best line to? Uh, okay. And the cheeky three, oh, yes. would you want to play a character role in it yourself? Okay. I feel like... All, All of these of podcasts. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's just me pitching for work. Like a horrible actor. Hey, take it. Writer. Take the opportunity. Yeah. Well, obviously, I think that the only Anderson show that I remember having a real connection to was, was well, Stingray. Stingray, really. Yes. So I guess that would be what I would have to That's go right. for. I have pitched a couple of ideas to Big Finish for fourth Doctor Adventures, which oh, have yeah. not materialised. But, yeah. you know, touch wood, maybe hey. at some point something may happen. But it's yeah, a right. very cool question. Yeah, Thank you. yeah, nice, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, one, two, I think there's three or four left. Oh, so let's, let's get through them, shall we? We'll bomb three. Right. Finish them off. Robert Monk. Was it strange stepping into your late mother's shoes and were you worried about what the fans would say? Loved you opposite Tim's third Doctor and John's break. Oh, that's lovely. Uh, Tim and John, lovely. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, obviously it was a bit strange. And I did say to my dad, do you think I should do this? Ah. And my dad said yes. And then I found out a few days ago that my dad wasn't really paying attention. He just <laughs> thought they'd ask me to do a character. Oh, really? So, but, but Daisy's dad apparently doesn't <laughs> listen to her either. So oh, I feel, no, that's terrible. So I feel that's fine. Uh, um, but but I'm, I'm guessing, I mean, yeah, okay, so your dad misunderstood that question. <laughs> but, but would he... Is he okay with oh, it? Oh, yeah, no, yeah, he's, yeah, he's fine. Yeah. He's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, but no, it was, it was lovely. Bittersweet, I would think. Yeah, For both definitely. of you, of course. Of and, course. And for the listeners as well. Yeah, you know, absolutely. We miss your mum, of course we do. Oh, but, I know. But love having you around in, you know, in her shoes. Oh, yeah, it was, yeah, it's been an amazing opportunity, yeah. so I'm grateful for it, even yeah. though, obviously, I'd rather she was, of she was course, here to do course, it. Of course, of course, of course. Alex Pass. Um, you can take any Anderson vehicle for a test drive. Which one and why? Oh, well, we've already uh, seen last week in Quickfire 5 that you were going home in uh, Lady Penelope's Royal Royal... No, no, it was Thunderbird 2, wasn't it? Yeah, was Thunderbird 2. <laughs> so I'm actually quite phobic about flying, but <gasps> I feel like I would feel safe yeah. in one of those. I yeah, don't know one of why. the Thunderbird's craft. Well, yeah. they're expertly piloted, you see. So this you'd is be, true. You'd be in safe, be safe hands. hands. And I feel like I could go into the cockpit because we're talking about, am, am I a control freak? Yes. Um, <laughs> I'd be able to see what's going on. So I feel like that's what I would choose. Well, I mean, what about in Stingray itself? What about uh, deep sea... Uh, well, after, after that um, Titanic submersible, maybe not. Yeah, maybe we'll leave that. Maybe <laughs> not, not. not to laugh at that, sorry. <laughs> no, no. Terrible, getting myself cancelled. <laughs> um, right, <clears throat> Paul Guy. Oh, given your parents' love of acting, were you always destined for the world of entertainment or did they try and persuade you to follow a different path? So my when my parents were working and I was much younger, there was a child's agent at my parents' agent that oh, took me on. Yes. And then when she left, my parents were like, that's a sign that you should just do child things and not, not be a child actor ah, and stuff. Okay. Um, and so I think they definitely did want me to do something else, which yeah. I agree with, <laughs> which right. I think is very sensible. Right. Um, but I do think that as parents, you should support what your child wants to do and figure out a way to support them from that foundation up, not push them down and say, you're not doing that. Mm. I feel like it needs to be Interesting. approached a different way. But yes, my parents definitely didn't want me to do it. <laughs> I mean, if I may say you're, you're a woman of many talents and facets, but so how, how, how would you describe, when someone says, what do you do? <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> um, I just say I'm a freelance creative. Yeah, so anyone yeah. that would, no, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say anyone that used to pay me. Um, <laughs> no, just that I, I happily do do lots of different things. But yeah. I think since obviously becoming a parent, that is that is my priority. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't like that necessarily oh, in a creative gosh. discussion. I have had people say to me that having children ruined my career, that you shouldn't have children, that if you have children with someone to get divorced, that it then derails your life. And I would oh. like to say to people, no, it does not. <laughs> And um, wow. you know that you can choose. You can choose that path, and you can do it with kids or, or without. Yes. So 
I mean, I have to say, obviously, my experience is vastly different for yours. I'm a, I'm a man, of course. Uh, but as a father and as an actor, uh, you know, acting is very sporadic, as we know. And it meant that actually I spent a lot of time at home with my kids. Oh, that's so lovely. I got to see a lot of them growing up and I changed all the nappies Aww. and I fed them their food. And, you know, the, a lot of dads don't get that experience. So actually, I would say if you're an actor and you want to have kids, well, that's probably the best way yeah. to do it. Because oh, you're going to see a lot of them. Yeah, no, that's absolutely <laughs> lovely. Really nice. There we go. Oh, and last one I think I is think it? Yeah, is. perfect. Oh, upside down. Jonathan Bell has Russell T Davis asked you to do anything for the 60th anniversary of Doctor Who. He has not, <laughs> and he has my email address. <laughs> Russell, why? No, why? I was going to say actually, probably by the time <laughs> this goes out, we'll know, won't we? Because the 60th has come and gone. Uh, but no. so you haven't had the call yet. No. <laughs> uh, I'm guessing, of course, like us all, you'd love to be a part of it. Oh yeah, of course. So, I think somehow. Um, yeah, but even just to work with someone like Russell, I think would just be amazing because he's such a. He's such an incredible talent, the way that he tells stories that that people need to hear mm. and in a way that people maybe not always aren't always receptive to straight away. But I mean, obviously, just think of something like It's a Sin. Yeah. Just incredible. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think everyone would love to work for Russell in some capacity. Yeah. And actually, even within the worlds of Doctor Who that he's created, he has mm. a way of, of, t- of bringing those messages kind of almost under the radar you're sitting there quite instantly enjoying mm. an episode of Doctor Who and then perhaps only realise oh this is about that isn't it yeah that's food for thought beautiful yeah, yeah that's right and um I think even you know just casting Yasmin Finney for the 60th mm-hmm. is so important and um you know people talk about things as being you know woke and all this kind of stuff and it's it's that is just so yeah. separate from what it is and I yeah. think to put um you know a, a trans incredible actress in a mainstream show that is also for children I think mm. you, it's just such a beautiful way to start that conversation about representation so yeah, that's right to start a conversation amazing. exactly yeah, right totally. yeah. and also you don't have to watch it yeah, you know what I mean? Exactly. You don't, if, if it's too woke for you, don't yeah, watch. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Uh, now, uh, we've spoken a lot about uh, a big finish, so uh, let's have a look and a listen uh, to Sarah Jane Smith in oh, action, shall we? Thank you. Back on good old space station, Nova. So what we have to do now is find the TARDIS. It's still here. What? Have they done this place up? It does look a little different, doesn't it? Three of them? Where the heck do three people just appear from? What the devil do they want? That's academic, surely, Commander. The point is that they're here without notice or warning and they've totally ignored the quarantine signals. They'll have to pay the penalty. Well, of course I know. I was there. Hey, Doctor! Sarah, are you all right? In the corner there. What? I what? A giant catapult with red flashing eyes. It moved. It seemed to be looking at me. Where's my 500-year diary? You keep a diary? Well, I live a fascinating life. I should publish. The reviews would be sensational. Ah. Hey, look, Doctor. Ahoy there! There's some fellow up there. Hello there! I'm a doctor. These are my assistants. Doctor? Yes, yes. We've returned to Nova to collect some medical specimens. That doesn't explain why you ignored our quarantine signal. Quarantine? You've risked catching the plague. Plague? Well, this day just gets better and better. <laughs> there we go. It's lovely. I was abroad, but that yeah. means totally. Uh, I mean, it's delightful, of course. There's Tom Baker. Uh, there you are. There's Chris Nader as Harry, Harry Sullivan. It's complete, isn't it? What did you consciously have to look for a way in for the character, or you know, obviously having grown up with your mum, were you were her rhythms already in there, or did you have to search for them? Well, I mean, I watched quite a lot of Doctor Who before going down to do that because ah. having never done it, I was quite apprehensive. Thinking, yeah. Oh gosh, you know, what's it going to sound like? Is it will it be terrible? Yeah. Um, but I think you're kind of ahead of the game, aren't you? When you've lived with someone and you have that same timbre to your voice and the same, getting those cadences and the RP of it. I don't know if you find this, the time period that something is set in can often help you find those rhythms and the grooves and having, um, obviously Chris Naylor is so fantastic and Tom was actually there, the only one that Ah. I'd done with him where he was there as well. Gosh, right. Um, Having that interplay, I think, helps helps you find the rhythm of, of how how their dynamic would be, that recreation. Yeah. How weird, though, talking about the plague, obviously doing it just before COVID. There you go, I know. <laughs> Seems a lifetime yes, ago. doesn't it? And how was your first day sort of in studio as opposed to being in isolation? Did you record that prior to COVID then? Yeah, so ah, that was November 2019. So that I was see. four, about four years ago. So how different an experience was it to be, you know, in the studio with people and then suddenly from home? Was 
did you miss a connection in some way? Or? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm I'm not great with names. I'm better with faces. So mm. all the ones that I did remotely, I can't remember anyone that's in it, what it's about, what happened, none of that. But mm. all the ones I did in studio, you remember who's yes. there and, yes. and that level of connection. And as an actor, I think you want to play, don't you? So you yes. want to be in the booth and be with everyone. Yeah, yeah. But it was it was great, really. I mean, going around the world in your pyjamas from home. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Can't, can't complain. No, that's um, true. I do remember we having to uh, stop at some point in the, in the one that we did with with, with uh, Chris Nader because I think he had some building going on next door oh, or something. Yeah. Oh yeah, um, I, I mean, Jamie, Jamie was saying to me before, like, has, has my terrible broadband or whatever improved? Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. But yeah, well, there's so Herald many tech, tech yeah, issues. That's right. Uh, now, Ross, who's on our team, will never forgive me if I don't ask you about Sarah Jane Adventures. Uh, so what did that mean to your family when, uh, when your mum found herself? Well, the centre of attention again, I guess. It was amazing, really. I mean, my... So obviously, you know, my mum had this great career in the 70s and things, mm. but she always prioritised, you know, family over career. So she had some opportunities in America that she turned down because her dad wasn't very well. Right. And then when I was born, I think she felt that she couldn't maybe be away from me. So she yeah. became more of a stay-at-home mum. But she always said to me that she knew that there was something else coming and that there would <laughs> be something else. Because she always said that she never let herself go because she knew <laughs> she knew at some point that someone would come come knocking. And yeah. after doing school reunion, I don't I think she thought that that was going to be the, the sure. full stop. And then when they asked her to do Sarah Jane Adventures, it was just yeah. amazing for her, really. You know, yeah. her like she would call, you know, her Angela Lansbury, Jessica Fletcher <laughs> moment right. where she gets to, you know, yeah. go around and solve all these mysteries and That's things. Right. And uh, I mean, Ross and I were talking about how adult Sarah Jane Adventures actually is when you, I mean, I watched, rewatched it recently. When you watch it as a block, it's so dark. I was yeah. like, oh. Well, then, I mean, this <laughs> I speaks to what you said earlier about, you know, it's good for children to experience, yeah. what's it, safe? It's a safe, yeah, danger in a safe That's way where right. they can, uh, you know, That's go right. through these big emotions. With a character they love and trust. Yeah, totally. And, and the wonderful thing about Sarah Jane Avengers, of course, was, you know, my generation, who, who remember Sarah Jane from, from back Aww. in the day, were now watching Sarah Jane Avengers with their children who also fell in love with her. So it's quite extraordinary. Yeah. And amazing, I think, for um, Russell and Phil Collinson and I, Nikki Wilson, I think. I can't remember everyone, mm. apology, but for them to conceive a show like that where this it's for kids and the lead is a six year old woman, I think is just Amazing. So so smart, you yeah. know, so clever. Yeah, sad in a way that that hasn't sort of ignited a flame elsewhere for other uh, older actresses, isn't it? Too? Yeah, I guess so. I feel like it is changing a little bit. Maybe I'm uh -huh. wrong, I don't yeah. know. But yeah. for children's television, I think it was such a, a bold move and Absolutely. very cool that it took off. Uh, so just before we round off, uh, what's next for uh, for Sadie Miller that you can talk about? I can uh, talk about um, so more more big finishes, mm. more more writing stuff. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, taking my my show on the road. Yes, uh, raising two small crazy boys. <laughs> That's <laughs> um, work enough. Yes, yes absolutely great. So uh, thanks so much for having me. It's been really good fun. Well, uh, yet again, I cannot say uh, this enough. It's our absolute pleasure to have oh, you, Sadie. You. Um, finally, where can we find you on uh, Instagram and so on? If our viewers and listeners want to follow you. Oh, yep. So my very long Instagram name. Uh, Sadie Miller, writer, VO, and all my other links are there on my Linktree link, so you Brilliant. can connect there. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much. It's lovely to meet you. Sadie Miller, everybody! Oh, Clap for you. <laughs> well, so nice. Sadie will be hanging around a little bit longer, of course. Oh, yes, she's got to, to help out on the old randomizer sofa. Bit of a randomizer loiter. Pardon? She's doing Random a bit of randomizer loiter loitering. to stay loitering. around. Loitering with intent to use the randomizer. Yes. That's right. Yeah, sorry, I was yes. just using the noun rather than... Anyway. Oh, that's fine, carry on. Yeah. Uh, so, thanks to Sadie for joining us. Thanks, uh, Sadie. Oh, next week I think we've got... Well, I mean, you know, the season is fast upon us, as you can probably tell from uh, uh, Chris Dale's um, jumper. Yes. But it's kind of Christmas. It's kind of Christmas. But well, it's not. certainly for the next couple of weeks, mm. it will be full on Terry Christmas. Terry it's a Christmas. Merry Terry Christmas. Everyone. Because Terry Adler will be joining us. Yes. Now, usually, as we know, at Christmas, Terry comes along and uh, helps out throughout the whole, helps out or hinders mm. throughout the whole podcast. But he's a busy man these days. I know. But he is giving up a lunch hour to come and sit with us in our usual interviews. Bless him. So uh, if you have any puns or uh, jokes or anything you want to ask Terry, uh, send them into podcast.jerryanderson.com because. Uh, not only is he a podcast favourite, but he also has a fascinating career in the worlds of Anderson and beyond. He does. Uh, much beyond. Still, even now, working in the film industry. And I'm He's sure a very we'll, busy boy. Yes, we'll learn more about that next time. So, uh, I think we should really head on over to the uh, randomizer sofa, don't you? See what's going on over there. See what Chris is up to with Sadie. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. Fine, if you like. Okay. Over to you. Well, Sadie, thank you very much for coming back to join us again for more of the Jerry Anderson podcast and another press of the, the randomizer button whenever you're ready. 
Now, there's been a lot of talk recently, people have wanted Stingray for quite some time. So, do you feel confident we're going to get Stingray today? I think maybe it's going to be the day. You think today's going to be the day? <laughs> well, look at that. Hey, hey, we finally have some Stingray. Craig Morris didn't get any. Sadie does. And it's the episode is Secret of the Giant Oyster, which has some lovely music. Sadie, your dream has come true. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> So, after a few weeks of uh, everybody wanting Stingray, you would think there's a 60th anniversary on the horizon or something, uh, we finally have a bit of Stingray. And uh, this is an episode that I had good memories of uh, up until I rewatched it on Blu-ray last year. And now I have to say it's not one of my favorites, actually. Um, it would be no picnic. Let's get... I think this is one of those episodes where yeah, the, well, we'll get into it, but I, I feel I should be honest and say up front, this is not a favourite. There are parts of this that I really love. Um, you're hearing one of it now, in, in fact, the, uh, the musical score for this episode. But it has to do a lot of heavy lifting, the, the score for this one. Um, as we open with two pearl divers. How much fighter, Mr. Ent Set? Entering a cave. But, but I don't see any. Give yourself time, Kingsland. Kingsland and other guy, um, very slowly making their way through caves, stopping every so often to ask each other how much further. Um, yeah, this this episode has a lot of underwater swimming footage, uh, often involving people we don't know. So straight away it's not the most enthralling opening to an episode even with the threat of a, a cave-in what's that noise but it's i said there's an element that's doing a lot of heavy lifting in this episode and that is the music uh because yeah there's not a whole lot going on in this episode i feel so so bad for for going at an episode straight out the gate saying actually i don't kind of like this but it was more it was more the fact that i remembered it with such fondness and then watching it again it was it was something of a shock to realize actually i don't get much out of this one beyond uh, again this music and uh, one or two interesting visuals um but we'll get into it. Maybe this time I'll go back to saying that I like it. Well, it must be 20 foot across. Mm. Hey, let's go down and take a closer look. Okay. But remember our air supply. We just got enough to return to the surface. Mm. Why did you not bring extra air tanks? Then you could spend more time down here. Ah, so there's a very big oyster. We gotta get it open. With lots of little oysters lined up around it. The shell to open on its own. Mm. And our air won't last out. What if this baby has got a pile in it, like the legend says? Let's just wait around and waste time. A million dollars. More like ten million. But we can't wait around to find out. If only we had more up-to-date breeding equipment. Yeah, 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 I know. But right now, let's get back to the ship. Time's running out. Mm. Again, some nice visuals. I do like this stuff. This, particularly this shot of Stingray coming up alongside and the very jazzy music, um, which I, I think is composed for Raptures of the Deep rather than this episode. But I always like it when you see Stingray alongside more conventional maritime uh, vehicles in this show. We be gunners. Yeah. Now let's get back to the boat. Say, look. Oh. Ahoy there. This is Captain Troy Tempest, World Aquanaut Security Patrol. Identify yourselves. Uh, I'm Mike Bromley, and, uh... Ah, oh, Bromley. Kingsland. Kingsland, okay. These waters are off limits. And it's interesting that David Graham is not using his, uh, his villain voice yet. Off limits? Um, what does he mean? Robert Easton is, is using one of his, um, villainous voices. Guess we'd better do as he says, huh? Where you're taking us, Captain? But at the moment, Back to our base at Marine. the David Graham character sounds a bit more sympathetic than, uh, Perhaps he deserves to, as we'll discover later in the story. 
Okay, start talking. I'm a busy man. Ah, but this is this is some well, prime Commander Shaw like stuff this, here. Sir, uh, me and Kingsland were investigating an old legend. I said, and... make it brief. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, this legend says that in a deep That's cavern. That's a brief. A fine shirt on uh, on the Kingsland puppet there. Which the legend says contains a pearl worth maybe ten million dollars. Well, we haven't got the right equipment to get the pearl. Troy, and... get these guys out of here. You know, we don't sponsor treasure hunting romantics. But, sir. Uh, except for that time where you and Phones went underwater and found a load of treasure. Radioactive isotopes, this could help us. Oh, yes. That's a casual uh, reference to some off screen uh, world building, really, for, for the Stingray universe. They use crushed pearls in reactors. And as soon as um, Shaw hears that, he's all on board with this scheme, you know. And I find it, uh, it is a, sub, a subplot for this episode, really, in that uh, there's a bit of an ecological angle. Everyone is very keen to get the pearl, either to make money or to use it to power a reactor. Everyone except Marina. Hey, you don't look too happy, Marina. Oh, she's got her frowning face on. What's wrong, Marina? You don't usually act like this in a mission. Don't you want us to go? <laughs> You're normally the life and soul of the party. Oh, I love Marina's Why smiling face. What about the pearl? Well, maybe it's some sort of superstition in the sea. You know, uh, about the pearl being a bad omen or something. Is that what you believe, Marina? Yeah. Phones oh, understands her. We can't let superstitions worry us. We've got a job to do. You know that. <laughs> um, yeah, this is the woman who's got a curse put on her, isn't it? Yeah, uh, a curse that says if she utters a word, someone she loves will die. Don't worry about curses, silly woman. Um, we've got jobs to do. Oh, dear. So, Stingray has made the way to the cave with the giant oyster with the pearl. I like the way the models seem to stop and have a look at the cave and then... You lead the way. ...cruise in for a landing. Take it easy. Yeah, good luck. I'm really rooting for you. Oh, Marina's still upset. Our superstitions, too. We have to learn to live with them, that's all. <laughs> like you have to live with your superstition of that curse thingy. Oh, dear, poor Marina. <sighs> she could just write it down. I mean, she can... I think she can write. Oh, yeah, because she wrote that whole um, essay in Marina Speaks explaining her backstory. So, we're back in the underwater cave for some more swimming. Good stuff. Slow stuff. Uh, again, it's, it's lovely visuals. There were some interesting colours uh, and angles. I like the way they sort of suggest that the cave is larger than it appears to be by putting um, more caveness around the edge of the frame and spraying all of this brightly coloured stuff about the place to suggest uh, various bits of sea moss and life and so on. We can afford to now with the Marineville breathing equipment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've been swimming for a whole four. 75 seconds. <laughs> Guess you're not scared, huh? What do you mean? Why should I be? Well, I've been down here before. If I wanted to, I could get you lost and leave you. Never find Again, the there's the slightly sinister tone in uh, David Graham's voice creeping in here. Now. Plus also the fact that Bromley is basically saying, hey, I'm a villain. You didn't know that, did you? Well, nothing suspicious in that little uh, conversation. Uh, more slow motion swimming footage. Hey, take it easy along this stretch, Tempest. This, uh... Part of the roof has a nasty habit of falling down. Yeah, go slowly. Last time. Great. That's all we need. <sighs> the roof. It's coming. Speed up. Keep going. So Bromley only just managed to avoid getting his skull caved in by some rocks. Luckily, Troy is there to drag him away from the danger before he gets completely squished. Oh, 
wow, something nearly happened there. Yeah, yeah, I, I, guess, I guess so. Does that mean they now can't go on? Clear. Forget it. Now, let's see how bad that rock fall is. Mm. But it'll take too long. Our air will blast out. We'll have to turn back. Who's scared now, Bromley? Come on, let's get working. Yeah, I don't think they do much of a much of a good job really establishing how long this tunnel is. Um, I just get the feeling that either the tunnel is really short and everyone is kind of whiny, or the air tanks are basically almost empty to start with. Um, a good hour's air supply. Okay. We'll have to work fast. So they are trying to suggest that this is taking much longer than it would appear to on screen. We're here. Follow oh. me. But you said we're here, so, you know, where's the pearl? Yeah, I'm kind of glad we don't have to watch the whole journey because, to be honest, this stuff is, is tedious enough. But then, I love, I love when Stingray builds up to um, revelations of something like this on the ocean floor by rising up some rocks first. They do it in uh, the big gun as well. It's fantastic. Yeah, and those smaller oysters. I've never seen them line up like that before. They're in a kind of pattern, like soldiers on parade. Now we've just got to wait until it opens. It had better be fast. We've got about 10 minutes before we have to start back to Stingray. <laughs> Where, does everybody buy their air tanks from the same place? This shallow breathing seems to be uh, in order here. But the music suggests that the oyster is about to open up. Come on, my beauty. Open up. There we go. No, not yet. We've seen that shot of Bromley like ten times already in this episode. How much longer, Tempest? <laughs> we'll have to start moving in five minutes. Oh dear, that could probably sum up this episode. How much longer? We can't wait any longer. It'll be suicide. We'll give it a few more minutes. We can't give up now. We haven't got time. Let's go. Just a couple more minutes. Well, you can wait here if you like. I'm getting out of here. Hmm. But we've come all this way. Oh well. We get to see every thrilling second of their journey back now. Nah, here we go. It's finally opening. Wait. And this music, I, I suddenly had the image of uh, the end of Crater 101 in my mind with uh, Linda Nolan. The rock. Ah. All's well that ends well. They should have been back by now. They won't have enough air. I'm going in after them. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say that why don't they send Marina, but obviously she doesn't want to... Uh, get involved with any of this pearl snatching that's going on. And I like the sadder tone to the music here as well. But I would also have to believe that, you know, superstition or no, if Phones felt Troy's life was in danger, Marina would be straight in there to assist. But no. So that just leaves her and Kingsland alone on Stingray. It's one of those episodes where every piece of music is reminding me of a scene from a different episode. Romney, don't stop. You'll die. Yeah, Troy's already carrying the pearls, so he can't stop for Bromley. Um, yeah. Again, I'm wondering if this is something that the uh, aqua sprites or the sea bugs could have helped with. Maybe it would be too narrow for the aqua sprites, but the sea bugs, you know, it would have got people through there quicker. But this episode isn't really interested in, uh, it doesn't really value people's time. Looks very nice, sounds spectacular, but there's a lot of very slow underwater swing scenes, which, yeah. I mean, it's generally accepted in live action productions that a lot of underwater swimming footage, if you've got that in your film or show, you're kind of facing an uphill battle to hold your audience's interest. Phones is here though, with, uh, see, he, he brought enough extra air tanks for everybody. Good old Phones. I'm glad someone's got their head screwed on. Guess Marina was right. This pearl's got a jinx on it. Well, no, not really. 
Not yet. Boy, hang on, I I'm coming. Didn't he just go past that rock? <sighs> yes, Troy. Get to work on these. Thanks, Holmes. You came just in time, I, I guess. I mean, I, I might have been about to make an amazing recovery and save both our lives, you know, but I guess your help was, uh, was invaluable. I guess it was worth it. Thanks. I guess. Elias phones. Oh, forget it. Uh, t uh, tell me, do you feel okay now? Yeah, I guess so. So Marina's entranced by right, the Poe. Back to Marineville. And now it's time for... Oh, see this beauty. Not so fast, Tempest. Ah, uh, yeah, we got a gun, see now, Tempest. I guess you weren't smart enough to figure out plans. I like the sort of red, streaky curve on it. You're crazy. But yeah, these two are villains. By playing it straight, 10% of the pearl's value will be yours. That's wow. just not enough, Captain Tempest. We want the pile. Don't be a Boy, fool, I... man. Listen, Tempest saved my life in that cave. Give him a break, King's Land. Don't tell me you're going soft, Bromley. This was your idea, remember? Why, the full value of that poil, I can buy all the ugly shirts in the world. Tempest, help me. Let him go. They can't do us any harm. Not out there in the ocean. No, I guess they can. Oh. OK, so Bromley just saved your life. Oh, it's all nice and cozy. Yeah, just get this straight. I am not leaving this ship. Get smart, Tempest. And the puppet playing Kingsland, I think turned up a few times in later episodes. Uh, was he behind the bar in the, the Blue Lagoon lounge, um, mixing drinks? But uh, I'm not sure about the other puppet. I don't remember seeing him again. But here we go. This possibly, well, almost certainly one of the greatest pieces of music Barry Gray ever composed for the series, let's say that up front, uh, used extensively through this show and Thunderbirds, and is you know, such a favorite, beloved by fans all over the world. However, I do find this sequence just a wee bit uh, silly. In fact, I kind of wonder if the, the sort of music was, uh, had a note against it saying, please make this as good as it can possibly sound because the visuals are a bit goofy. Got these tiny little um, later. fleet of sort of chicken nugget things um, getting up off the seabed and flying through the, the tunnel out to Stingray. I mean, the imagination on display here is, is quite something. It's a striking image, but just the, the visuals of these tiny little um, uh, oysters. We figured out these controls. Yeah. And the fact that they all bank and, and weave as uh, a single unit, which of course they would be, because they're probably all attached to the same what thing. Are they? Be yeah. I, I find the, the music is just, oh, one of the greatest bits of music ever composed for the series. The visuals, I don't feel quite, quite do it there. Uh, but it is a nice image to see Stingray getting gummed up um, as all these oysters attach themselves to the, the rotor at the back. And I suppose it is fun in a sense that you have here essentially a mystery that never really gets resolved or explained. Are each of these alive and, or are they working as a, a single mind? Are they controlled by the giant oyster? Um, worked out. Say, what's yeah. that noise? Ah, relax. There it is. There's that, uh, that Gordon Tracy line. Ah, relax. Well, yeah. Oh, so, Here we go. Stingray is now covered in oysters. Can't move. Hmm. We're not moving. Uh, what, what's wrong? Marina has seen everything. She understands where the oysters have come from. Now it's back to tell Troy and Phones. Yeah, it's, I don't know. I, I to be honest, I hope I'm alone in, uh, in feeling that the visuals in that sequence aren't 100%. She's trying to tell us something. <laughs> she seems what to is want it, us to girl? go down. Yeah, but the music, obviously, you can forgive any sin uh, in this episode. Even swimming sideways, uh, because the music is just wonderful. 
And I think possibly Stingray has the greatest overall soundtrack of any Anderson series. There's just, there's the March of the Oysters, there's the big gun theme, there's the main theme, and there's all this stuff that was just reused again and again in later years. They're oysters? But why have they gathered around Stingray? Hmm. I don't know. I've never seen anything like it. It's as though they've been attracted by something. Yeah. Phones. Come on. I've got it. Yep. A giant pearl. Yay, he Maybe got that. you're right. But one thing's for sure, Brownlee and King are not bottled up good. Ah, oh, well, who needs them? Um, is this where they take Marina back to the surface to ask her a question? What, what are we going to do? I'll try the hatches. You'll keep on panicking. The hatches are jammed. We can't do a thing. We're entombed in here. Wait. Tempest. Maybe he can help. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Get him on the radio. He's got to <laughs> help. Okay. Stingray to Tempest. Can you hear me? I've often wondered about that um, prop just to the left of, the, the right of Bromley there. It almost looks like a car radio of the time. So what are we going to do? You got any ideas? I guess not, Troy. I reckon there's no way of moving those oysters. Mm. Yeah, guess that pearl's causing all the trouble. I've got it. Maybe if we get rid of the pearl, the oysters will leave. Mm. It's a chance. I guess Marina would know. Yeah, but she can't hear us down here. Take her up to the surface phone and ask her if it'll work. Okay, Skipple. Yeah. Again, there's a lot of uh, padding in this episode, and... Uh, some of it is to make the story work right there. They can't talk to Marina underwater, but it's just, it's very slow. I don't want to not like um, a, an episode of any Anderson show, but this one, it's been a long time since I've felt an episode kind of fall from grace in my rankings so extensively as this one did. And back to Troy. The pearl's ready to go. Good. While you're there, you can put your guns on the tube, too. Oh. Marina figures it will work, Troy. Great phones. Let's hope she's right. Mm. You all set, Bromley? Yep. Okay. Operate missile launch controls. I love how Bromley knows all these controls. I mean, admittedly, a lot of them are labeled. So, Pearl has been returned to the sea, expelled from Stingray. Now, uh... Let's do some waiting. I haven't had enough of that in this episode. Here we go. Ah, oh dear. Yes, it's just... It's a silly image. It's... I don't know if it's the fact that the scale... Um, you, you really sense the strings that these, these little model uh, oysters are attached to. But now they've removed themselves from Stingray, and attaching themselves or clustering around the, the pearl from the giant oyster. Yeah, what a, a thrill to hear that being played live at the uh, Standby for Action concert. I think it was also played at the uh, Royal Festival Hall concert as well. They shoot us. And Bromley stopped you shooting us. So I'll return the favor. Now we're quits. Yay! I'm taking you back to Marineville to spend a long time in jail. Okay. Tie them up, Marina. Marina? Marina! <laughs> Marina's our designated tire-upper. Uh, but this is a lovely scene and a lovely way to end the episode. Uh, the music, the visuals, the character, it all works lovely here as Marina returns the, the pearl to the giant oyster. Looks very happy about it. And the pearl is uh, back where it belongs and the oyster closes and that closes out the episode and um, yeah that was Secret of the Giant Oyster as I said I, I remember it fondly as a kid but it oh I don't want to say it doesn't hold up but it hasn't held uh, it hasn't held its place in my rankings I was really surprised watching this last year how how much it just didn't click for me anymore. There is a lot of padding in this one. There is a lot of back and forth and coming and going that doesn't really amount to a whole lot. And to be honest, I kind of think the focus might be in the wrong place. I don't really, I'm not that invested in the whole 
let's take the pearl away and we can use it in our nuclear reactors. But I, I do find that um, curse angle quite interesting and the light focus on Marina. Uh, more of that would have been interesting. Um, perhaps if you'd replace the two pearl thieves with an alien race that could, you know, speak in a way that Marina can't. Um, so, Secret of the Giant Oyster, it's, it's not one of my favourites. Uh, it's very slow, very padded, but that wonderful incidental theme just saves the episode. Uh, yep, wonderful music. Well done, Barry Gray. Thanks, Chris. Stingray. Love a bit of Stingray. I love a bit of Stingray. Yeah, despite its sort of over-saccharine. No! Yes, yes. Really? No, I like that about it. Heartwarming. Camp. Right. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Both words that have been applied to me in <laughs> Only the one, actually, past. I should pick on. Yeah, all right, let's move on. Anyway, over on YouTube, people oh, have yes. been commenting under our videos, which they James, have. you know. Yes, they have, that's yes. right. Particularly beneath uh, pod 281, which, if you remember, mm. was our interview, my interview with Mark Braxton from Radio Times, well. who quite coincidentally had given us a nice little review. It was in, co completely it was coincidental. Complete There's no coincidental. bribery no, here. No, it wasn't, no. No, 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 no. no. no uh, Ian Dealey, 9033. I'm just going to call him Ian Dealey. That'll That's do. probably the name he goes by. Yeah. I remember when Thunderbirds was being repeated on BBC Two in the year 2000, and the Radio Times did a very special issue to celebrate the show's return. Wonderful memories. Mm. Lovely. Yeah. Uh, Black Arrow Tunes. Right. Probably not right. Real, yeah. Uh, looking forward to the new Terrorhawks books, hopefully by December 2023. Yes, you will have them by then. The mm. new history of Terrorhawks, the comic strip compilation, and the new comic book, plus the newly assembled soundtrack celebrating 40 years of Terrorhawks. Great news. Thanks. Wow. It is great news. Good time to be a Terrorhawks fan, then. Yes. Specifically time for the 40th anniversary. Well, which has just been gone, of course. Yes. But yes, well, it's the 40th anniversary year, isn't it? Sure. Goes on until next October. Ah, oh, so you've got a whole year of Terrorhawks oh, stuff coming Oh, yes. Up. In fact, I've got some Terrorhawks beers in the car. I bet you have. Yeah. Not in the car? Are they warm? I've, no, I brought them so I can yes. give everyone a can. Oh, for Christmas. Yes, that's a Christmas present. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Andy Show and Tell says, hats off. Uh, oh, a bit like the... Fab fact we had recently about the... Uh, uh, yes, hats off to Jamie, Richard and Chris for another great entertaining podcast. Ah, it's nice, isn't it's it? Lovely, yeah. yeah. And finally, mm. Leah Powell, 4581. Oh, right. Uh, yes, says, I'm sure you get this a lot, but Fab Pod, once again, an amazing episode on oh, the randomizer. Yeah, well, we do get it a lot, actually, but it's, it's always uh, nice stop. to see. Never no, stop. That's right. We, it's great. We like to think that we're hitting the mark occasionally. Yes, Poor Mark. That's <laughs> yeah. why he won't be coming back. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah, all for now. But yes, there's all sorts going on on our YouTube channel. Mm. Um, new stuff every week, uh, let alone uh, the podcast and uh, Fab Facts, which occasionally pops up there as well. But uh, also brand new uh, documentary series and uh, yes, primers. Lots and, more um, besides. Uh, Beyond Anderson, featuring uh, articles and items about actors who have appeared in Anderson's shows. Yes. There is, however, a rather marked omission, I think. Is that. there? Yeah, there's one particular actor who appeared in the Jerry Anderson series who's yet to appear appear on Beyond Anderson. Right. Uh, <coughs> Can't think of no, anyone never mind. in particular. Okay. Well, anyway, well, we'll see you next week for more Randomizer. Great. Uh, Terry Adlam joining us for a Terry Christmas as we gear up for the big day itself. Yay! Uh, and uh, more from our <laughs> Podstrons. So we'll see you then. Great. Bye. Bye. This is Christmas Control. Stand by. Let's go. Spectrum is green. So which actor are you specifically referring to? Well, I mean, I've done a... lots of work since my famous work on Space Precincts, and I've yet to appear and be... Maybe you have to be retired or older. I think or you have to be even... of a certain age. Really? Yeah. I mean, I'm getting there. I know, give it a couple of years and you will be all over Beyond Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> Trouble you... is, you know, people know what I've done Beyond Anderson because they're watching now. This could, is, could you tell them? This is kind of really it, it really, isn't this it? This is you, yes. Podcast. So you, actually, you can only do Beyond Anderson when you're no longer involved with Anderson stuff. Oh, right. Then you're beyond... Anderson. Oh, God, imagine that. I mean, the day's going to come, isn't it, where I yeah. go, all right, or you say, 
yeah, that'll do. And I step back from it. Or both. And suddenly I wake up in the morning and it's like, what do I do with my day? Yeah. Or why, why on earth did I put myself through that for six years <laughs> or whatever else you feel? Six years. Right, that's the limit, is it? No, that's not. That, that, yeah, that was just a random number I pulled there. out of the... We're already up to five, so no, that means I've got I less than a year out left. Of a, uh, <sighs> out of a, a Space 1999 lunchbox. Right. <clears throat> no. But there will be, of course, a time which will be our, our last podcast. I don't want to think about it. Let's not do that. Okay, let's, let's, let's move on to something happier. <laughs> Lunch? <laughs> oh, fish finger sandwich. Yes. All right. Bye. Bye. That was an Anderson Entertainment production.